Welcome everyone. I'm Michelle Gold, board chair at Holocaust Museum LA. Thank you all for joining us for today's program, Building Bridges, a monthly discussion series that brings together leaders of community organizations for a conversation about working toward common social justice goals. For today's discussion, we are so pleased to welcome leaders from each of our four partner organizations, Julie Bank, board chair for Jewish Center for Justice, Michael Lawson, president and CEO of Los Angeles Open League, Helen Tours, executive director of Hispanis Organized for Political Equality, Hope, and Nancy Yap, executive director, Center for Asian Americans, United for Self empowerment cause. The conversation will be moderated by Dan Schnur, professor at USC's Annenberg School of Communication and board member at Holocaust Museum LA. Holocaust Museum LA brings you programs like today's discussion at no charge. If you are enjoying our programs, we ask that you consider supporting our work by making a donation to the museum at holocaustmuseumla.org or by becoming a member. More information about our membership and a complete list of benefits is available at holocaustmuseumla.org slash membership. It is now my pleasure to formally introduce the moderator of today's program, museum board member, Dan Schnur. Dan is a professor at USC Annenberg School of Communications, UC Berkeley's Institute of Governmental Studies and Pepperdine School of Public Policy. Dan, thank you so much for helping us create the Building Bridges program and for serving as moderator today for another exciting installment in this series. Hi. Well, Michelle, thank you so much. And thanks to you, to Beth, to Safina, to Wendy, to the entire team at the museum, not just for all the help you give us on these programs every month, but on all the good work you do. And so we're all very, very grateful to you. Um, we were talking just before we started that uh, the group and I, we realized this is the seventh in this series that we've done. And so we're not only grateful, of course, to the team at the museum, we're also grateful to all of you who, did, who joined us every month or most months to participate in these conversations. It's something we really enjoy. And we're very glad that you get something out of valuable out of them also. As some of you may know, uh, last month, uh, several of our organizations, uh, the LA Urban League, the Center for Asians United for Self-Empowerment and Hispanics Organized for Political Equality co-sponsored the latest in a series of statewide California public opinion polls in which we measured public opinion on any number of issues, including race relations, discrimination, uh, the threat of the coronavirus, and any number of other issues. In last month's poll taken in the immediate aftermath of the election, we polled the electorate on a number of the ballot initiatives that had just been voted on in the November 3rd election. And as you might guess, for many of us, the defeat of Proposition 16, the ballot measure which would have resurrected uh, affirmative action as uh, part of the college admissions and government contracting processes in California, is something that we spent a lot of time thinking and talking about. It's one of the many issues that we've polled on. And more broadly than the poll, these issues of discrimination in California uh, are, are matters that occupy a great deal of all of our time in all of our organizations and all our communities. And so, Michael, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to start with you, uh, given our poll results and given the conversations we've had before and after the election. What did we learn, Michael? What did we learn from the defeat of Proposition 16? And how does the outcome of that election affect your thinking on how we can best address issues relating to race and gender-based discrimination in California. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, and I uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this discussion. 
uh, again. Um, the, the, this, this is a complex issue. Um, and it was a proposition that uh, was trying to address uh, a complex issue that uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, shorthanding as uh, systemic racism. Um, and, and there were a couple of different things that I think happened. One was, um, I'm, I'm not sure that, that um, the proponents of Prop 16 did uh, the right, uh, spent the amount of time and effort necessary to explain to people who weren't around when, uh, when, when the anti-affirmative action uh, proposition came in uh, to explain why it was there and why it was needed. Uh, but there's been a lot of talk around uh, systemic racism, and it's a term that's been thrown around. Um, but I do, don't think that there's been enough discussion about that aspect. Uh, or the, the this was the target of, of, of Prop 16, and I'm not sure that people understood what we meant by systemic racism. Basically, we were talking about a, a situation that exists today where um, racist um, either statutes or, 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 or processes uh, have been in place that had, had, uh, designed to have an adverse impact on one group or another so that you could uh, eliminate or, or get around uh, hiring or, or, or accepting uh, uh, people of a certain uh, race, gender, uh, uh, or, or, or other label without actually using that term. And affirmative, the, the affirmative action uh, uh, programs are designed to, to counteract that directly by saying we recognize that um, that uh, uh, these elements are there because of a racist uh, system that was set up before, and the only way to address it is to address it directly. Let me give you an example, um, and it's the difference between how the country has dealt with uh, the crack epidemic and how the country is dealt is dealing with the opioid epidemic. The country dealt with the crack epidemic by, by um, arresting people and putting them in jail. And they're dealing with the opioid uh, epidemic by giving people health care and giving people uh, the tools necessary to uh, come out of this, 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 this horrible situation. The former gave millions of people a record that they had been incarcerated. Um, and that in and of itself would keep them from uh, getting certain jobs, would keep them from getting into certain schools and so on and so forth without ever mentioning the word race. Um, and if you don't recognize that and take, quote unquote, an affirmative action to, uh, to, to eliminate that factor. What you have is a situation where you can discriminate against uh, uh, African Americans without even mentioning the fact that you're discriminating against African Americans. So to use that as a simple example, that's what this, uh, what Prop 16 was, was trying to give us this toolbox, this tool in our toolbox necessary to address these inequities that had come before. Um, I don't think anybody would argue with the fact that the treatment of uh, crack users and the treatment of opioid users should be different. They should have been the same. And the, the, the aftermath of these shouldn't be different as well, but they are. And Prop 16 would have given us the tools to address not just that one, but the other systemic racist uh, 
uh, laws and, and practices that have been on the books uh, for decades that would allow us to make this, as, as we like to say, a more perfect union, if you will. Um, I don't think that we did a good job of making that narrative clear, number one. Number two, we have uh, different pockets of ethnicities within this state, uh, which are, have not been talking to one another and have uh, ideas and, and, and perceptions of each other that uh, uh, made it look like we were pitting one against the other and that there was a zero sum game that, that, that by uh, allowing for affirmative action to come back, uh, you would be taking away from one group and giving to another. Uh, that narrative wasn't addressed uh, adequately, uh, but I think that there were some good things that came out of this. Number one is that although the message, I don't, I don't think the message got through clearly, the conversations were started. There are conversations between uh, the African-American community, the Hispanic community, the Asian community, uh, and, 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 and others that we weren't having a year ago. A part of it is a function of the uh, outrage that the, the, the correct outrage that uh, this co the rainbow coalition of people who came out after the George Floyd murder. Um, I see, I, I, even though the, 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 uh, the proposition didn't win, I think that what we have created is a platform that will allow us to have these conversations in not just a civilized manner, but in, in a constructive manner. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to continuing these conversations. Uh, as they say, uh, Rome wasn't built in a day and, and, and uh, it's going to take some time to, to move the needle, but the conversations have started and the conversations are good ones, I believe. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm disappointed about uh, the, the, the outcome of this particular proposition, but I'm optimistic about the conversations that we're having. Michael, thank you very much. Um, Nancy Yap, I know you've spent a great deal of time looking over those poll results for some guidance on how best to move forward. I'm wondering if you'd be willing to offer some of your thoughts both on what you think may have occurred and what a path forward might look like. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dan, and thank you everyone for having me here. Um, and I think in this series, for those of you who've been with, uh, with us for some of the other conversations, one of the things I think comes up quite often um, is some also where some of our similarities are as communities and not just our differences. Uh, and I think for me, the diversity of not just our communities with one another, but also inside the Asian and Pacific Islander community really showed through in some of this data. What I will say is that uh, around Prop 16 and everything Michael just shared, I think that I too am really optimistic about the conversations that are happening. There is a candor that is happening around them. And some of our data did show that our communities actually do believe uh, that representation and diverse representation is important across the board. Although they may not feel that Prop 16 in itself was the solution, I think that that unifying identifier will help us to not just have these candid conversations around what solutions can look like, but also to be able to have a moment for us to build with one another about what it looks like for us to have a solution that works for all of us. And I think we've started some of that work even here, just learning about each other's diversity inside our communities and also hearing the concerns about what Michael also shared, which is where we may be trading one for the other. I think that's been happening um, in terms of diversity from women and people of color for some time 
is this fear that we replace one another. Uh, and at the same time, I think there's a way for us to advocate together so that that is not true. Um, and it does seem that from the data in our report that, that, that there is an importance across the board around that diverse representation. And people just want a solution that makes sense, that feels like it's right for them too. Um, because they're seeking diverse representation that represents them. And as someone who often doesn't see myself or my community reflected in some of these stories and reports, um, I think it was it's really important to, when we say we believe in diverse representation, that we also mean we want to see ourselves. Um, and I, I think that that's uh, one of the things I find to be hopeful in the data is that that conversation can continue and we can kind of start to close that gap um, between the solution and this feeling of wanting representation. Well, I think that, that is very encouraging, Nancy. Thank you very, very much. Um, Julie Bank, let me, uh, let me ask you this. Um, yeah, our Jewish community is not as directly, well, is not impacted in the same way that perhaps other underrepresented communities are, would have been either by Prop 16 or by this discussion taking place in other formats. But if you can address also on uh, this, this broader conversation that Michael and Nancy have just referenced, can you talk a little bit about what you see as that conversation looking like and what the Jewish community's uh, uh, role is in that conversation? Absolutely, thank you so much um, also for having me be a part of this conversation representing Jewish Center for Justice. I'm really honored to be sitting at the table with all of you amazing um, leaders in your communities. And one of the things in looking at the poll, and I, I told you all in our prep call that I spent a lot of time studying the poll and the answers and the results, and it was really fascinating. Um, one thing that really stood out to me was this disconnect between personal beliefs and the way people were voting. Um, one of the questions in particular that like pe many people had a very strong support for the ideas of diversity and inclusion. One of the questions, 67% of respondents said they personally felt that diverse representation was important. Yet Prop 16 didn't pass and like Michael and Nancy have talked about, it, it could be because it wasn't the right thing. It wasn't the right time possibly. I also think that the, the system in general is very problematic on a variety of levels. And the way that the proposition was presented, I think was really convoluted and hard to understand. I feel like for the most most of the propositions, they were really hard for the average person to know what they were voting what they were voting for. Um, they're also lumped together. They're often poorly written. A lot of um, they're confusing, and the education that people are getting around it are you know often TV ads that are paid for by special interest groups. So there's only certain information going out there. Um, the other thing is that they are put into the election cycle every two years, and this election cycle in particular was uber focused on the presidential election, and, and that was a very consequential, people have said that it's maybe the most con consequential in modern history. So I... I feel like, you know, I'm going to give my fellow Californians the benefit of the doubt that they really do care about racial equality and it's a priority for them, even though this particular proposition did not seem to be the answer. Um, I, I think that we as leaders and where the Jewish community comes in to get back to your question, Dan, is that we need to really continue and deepen our conversations and really methodically look for solutions as activists and and we need to compel the legislators to do the same thing. Um, we, it would be great if this was taken care of 
by our state's elected officials, but I'm gonna also assume that we're not gonna fix the proposition system. It's gonna stand. So we need to bring, we, we need to broaden our conversation from, from this table out into our communities. We need to provide the education. We need to listen and hear what the solution really is. And I think that's really, you know, broadening and strengthening the conversation is, is gonna be the key. And hopefully we in the Jewish community can continue to be, to be a part of that and help look for solutions. Well, thank you. Thank you, Julie. And I, I also, I finally, last and certainly not least, I'm very glad to welcome Helen Tautis to the, to the conversation. And Helen, you and I have known each other for a long time. And I know you value conversation, but I also know that you value action. And so maybe if you're willing, you can give us some insight into what you're thinking about in terms of what needs to be done going forward. As Julie correctly mentioned, as we talked about previously, um, we know from the polling results that voters in California are deeply concerned about discrimination and are, are looking for other ways to address that challenge. Um, how did the results of the initiative affect your thinking? And what do you think we ought to be focusing on in terms of next steps? Well, I think a couple of things. Thanks, Dan, first for um, always making sure that there was a, a, a space for hope in all these conversations, um, both uh, for the organization and for being hopeful. I think both are very important. I think one of the key things that um, I walked away from was what I went into knowing going into this election. Our communities over the last two decades in which affirmative action has not been implemented in California because of 209, um, didn't understand what affirmative action was. Did, and we know this from the polling where even when asked, you know, good idea or bad idea, over 29% of Latinos said they weren't sure. So that, that you know, that right there would have made the difference if there was a, um, um, uh, the timing was different in which we would have more time to create some um, education I think moving forward, uh, we have to ask ourselves as leaders, how are we bringing people along to not only you know, listen to us and what we think the solutions are, but that we're hearing from them what possible new solutions can be put into place when combating discrimination. And as Michael has had the systematic racism that everyone seems to know and believes is part of the system, but perhaps we're just not in unity right now what how to combat it or the solutions to it. So a point of action is that we can't take this as a defeat, but as a great step moving forward of not only engaging in dialogue, but really bringing people along with solutions. Um, there was the analogy Michael used about the toolbox. I feel like we need to kind of break down that toolbox and think about how do we rebuild it and put new tools into it and make sure that, especially with our younger generation, and we know with um, you know Asian Pacific Islanders and Hispanics, we're a very young population here in California. There's a lot of great opportunity here. And I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from the Jewish community of how they effectively share their common history with the next generation. So I see a lot of opportunities here to take action, um, a lot of opportunities to invite people to think out of the box and create that new toolbox with new tools. Um, so I'm pretty optimistic. And I think the poll has um, given us reason to be optimistic. As I mentioned, as many people that voted against us were uh, you know, against op the affirmative action, at least according to our poll, there was almost as equal, but people just weren't sure of how to proceed. And um, that's a big call to action for all community leaders. Well, Helen, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that's a really, really smart way of, of looking at this. Before we broaden the conversation and uh, go to the next round of questions for all of you, I should remind our audience that if you have a question you'd like to add 
uh, into the conversation, please by all means type it into the Q&A function uh, that's available to you. And we'll do our best to address as many of those as possible. Uh, we received not a question, but a, a comment. I think it's a fairly commonly held sentiment um, from Christy Marlin, who I think speaks for many, many people when she says, propositions drive me crazy because they are frequently poorly written and hard to understand. Well, Christy, I could not agree with you more. What I will tell you, going back to the point that Julie was making a minute or two ago, um, there's actually public opinion polling that shows the overwhelming majority of Californians agree with you. And they are very dissatisfied with the initiative process for any number of reasons. That said, California voters, by even larger margins, would fiercely oppose any effort to significantly change or eliminate the initiative process. So in other words, we might be frustrated by it, but we don't want to give it up yet. So let's, uh, so as Julie correctly pointed out, we'll need to learn to live with it. And as several of our panelists have pointed out, perhaps there are other ways to take on uh, a community's or a state's greatest challenges. Nancy, let me come back to you. Because while we've been focusing on a particular initiative on election day, here we are in the 12th month of just this incredible, extraordinary, unprecedented year on any number of fronts. But when we talk about issues like race relations and discrimination, there have been any number of seminal events over the last over the last 11, 12 months. I'm wondering if you wouldn't mind broadening the scope for us to start off the next round of this conversation. Look back at the year and maybe you can share with us some thoughts on what we've learned about these issues over the course of 2020. Sure. Um, I think for me, the data, because it was done, so this latest survey is the third in a series. And the survey started in February. And then I, to your point, Dan, this year has just had a lot of different things that have, I feel, highlighted um, and really educated people around conversations of race relations and discrimination. And so um, between February and July, what we saw was an increase in awareness around discrimination for the communities of color. And, um, and for me, I don't know that I believe there was an increase in discrimination across the board. I think it highlighted what was there. Um, and that includes some of the anti-Asian sentiment around the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so that language was possible because our communities were seen as other and that we could be separated that way and talked about that way. Um, and I think that that awareness um, showed up in our July survey and has stayed pretty consistent into November. Uh, this increased awareness that all of our communities are um, experiencing discrimination. And on one hand, I'm like, oh, well, is that for me, it's about a leveling. Like we are now seeing that more people are aware. So what do we do with that awareness? And I think that is something important for all of us to think about as in our organizations, um, we strategize for moving forward. So it, for me, I think as also an advocate for Asian and Pacific Islander communities, sometimes it's also about educating folks that we are experiencing something, but it doesn't mean that other communities aren't experiencing it as well. And I think the poll really gave us great data too that all of us are experiencing something and folks are aware of it. Um, so much like I was saying um, about the proposition is now at least we have a place to start from in terms of our advocacy and where we can continue that education because these systems are also very broad and sometimes just as confusing, if not more so than the propositions too. Um, and so I, I think that there's a lot of, of work there to be done. I, th I think you're, you're, you're exactly right, Nancy. Um, Julie, I'd like to bring you back into the conversation and pose the same question to you that Nancy just addressed. Over the course of this incredible extraordinary 11 plus months, what have you learned about these issues that we are to reflect on and use to our benefit going forward? Thanks, Dan. And I'm really gonna build on what Nancy just talked about. I think that it's more clear than ever that we 
need to work together that not only do we need to educate our own communities, we need to educate each other. We, and we need to continue to really think hard about how we can work together. We need to really, we need to have a strategy. We need to plan. We need to think about, I think this is, a, this is our window of opportunity. Do we, um, are there, are there, is there a way for, I'll use our four organizations as an example. Um, is there a way for us to together join current coalitions that are out there strengthening existing coalitions? Or is this an opportunity for our four organizations to come together as a new coalition and affect change? Um, I think that, um, you know, we also have to consider that we, what we have formed here just by sitting on this panel together and through the process of preparing and, and talking to one another a lot leading up to these different moments where we are, you know, talking and, and holding these webinars, we've created very grass tops relationships. And now we have to deepen those bringing our each of our communities into that deeper, richer conversation. Um, the other lesson, and it goes along, is that we are doing some really great work and we're doing it without Sacramento. They're doing great work too. They're working, they have their own relationships forming, but there's a disconnect between what we've been able to do. I mean, no, nobody, no one in Sacramento said, hey, can you, um, can you guys um, co-sponsor a poll so we can get a feel for what Californians are thinking? This was something that you decided was important and needed to be done, and so you did it. So the next maybe the next step is is figuring out you know how how to make a more deeper impact because it would be great if and we talked about this in one of our in one of our previous meetings if um the black latino api or jewish caucuses knew what we're doing here and what we're thinking and and how we're moving things along. And I think it's up to us to really start to make sure that they do know, that they do know that the good hard work that we're doing and the way that we are, you know, able to get, get that message out to our communities and across communities is really important. Um, but I think we have to do it in concert with each other and we can, and we can get much further if we do. Thank you very much, Julie. And I, I, Helen, let me ask you this. Of all the many challenges we've attempted to navigate through this year, I know you've spent a good amount of time, a particular amount of time, thinking about the conversations that have been taking place, not just here, but around the country, on criminal justice and race relations, and that you've come to some conclusions from that particular discussion that might be useful to us going forward. Would you be willing to share that with us? Yes, um, I think one of the key conclusions that I came to is that um, because of the nature, because of the fact that we all witnessed the murdering of George Floyd um, through social media, through our televisions, um, we have as a society, and rightly so in a lot of reasons, for a lot of reasons, equated combating discrimination with criminal justice reform. Um, and some of the criminal justice reform ballot measures that did come through, I think, was a way of people saying, okay, we can do this because we know that there's an issue here. That didn't translate, if you will, to the other reforms that we were hoping to get across. Um, and I think there's a lot there to unpack and to start understanding. I don't have all the answers around that. But I do think that for right now in all, you know, collectively, we do have this moment to ensure that there is criminal justice reform, police reform, but we also receive some caution about how we speak to this. And in the poll specifically, if we could all recall back in July, when we asked about the term defund the police, 
across all ethnicity and race and gender, there was only about 6% support for that concept. However, that changed drastically when we talked about specific police reforms that we wanted to see, where there was a huge amount of support for it. So I walked away from, from all of that, understanding that as we all know, messaging and language matters, who the narrator is matters, who we sometimes unfortunately allow to take that message and warp it has made a huge impact. So as community leaders, when we're talking about criminal justice reform, and as Michael mentioned with that great example of how back in the day, how we as a society treated individuals that were going through really difficult times and we're utilizing crack as opposed to those that are now, you know, finding themselves with this opioid addictive um, uh, place, we need to start thinking about how we take that message and also be able to be bold enough to cry out when there is race that is being um, impacted negatively uh, and how we do that. And what I mean by that is so we don't use defund the police, but we do talk about how funding needs to go into low income communities and how we want to have special programs that will ensure uh, police accountability. I, I think that's gonna be really crucial and important at this moment. What I don't want to be seen is that you know we look at the overall election and walk away and say, oh my goodness, it was all those crazies about to fund the police, or you know that they you know they were out there protesting that scared people. Perhaps it did, but we can't be co-opted by that fear, um, and really need to push forward. I, I saw an analysis right after the election that suggested if it takes you five minutes to explain your slogan then perhaps it might not be a bad idea to find another slogan. And so, but I think your point about messaging and language is exactly right, not just in this particular context, but more broadly, Helen. Well, Michael, let me ask you this. I think Helen correctly reminds us that messaging matters, that language matters. But I know that one of the things you've spent a lot of time thinking about is not just the importance of having a conversation, but what type of conversations. And the tone matters too. And I'm wondering, over the, what, given what you've learned over the course of the year, how you see the types of conversations that need to take place? What, what should those conversations look and sound like? Um, the, the, what I've noticed is um, the conversation, that, that there's a difference between conversations and just talking to people. Conversation involves listening. Uh, just, uh, you can put something on a billboard. Um, that's not a conversation. Uh, but when you're in a room and you're, you're, you're listening to the other side, what I'm, what I've seen over the past few months are more conversations and is, is, I, I don't think you need a PhD to understand what the difference is and, and, and how important that is. And we're starting to have those. There was a, a um, I, I want to go back to the, the, the civil rights movements in the, in the 50s and 60s. And you were having that sort of a, uh, th those conversations were being had uh, uh, between um, uh, religious groups and, and uh, the civil rights organizations. Uh, and I go back to Reverend Lawson, uh, who uh, not a relative of mine, but but a hero of mine, um, and, uh, and and what he brought back from uh, the the you know India and 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 taught um, people who were in the nonviolent movement how to uh, uh, conduct themselves, and and the coalitions between. Uh, the African American community and the Jewish community and, and other religious communities as well. Uh, there were conversations. Somehow we got away from that. Um, and but we, we need to get back to that. And the fact of the matter is, that's what I saw when I, you, you saw the rainbow coalition of people 
who were, were out protesting the murder of George Floyd and, and, and Breonna Taylor and, and, and others. Um, this was uh, the beginning of conversations that, that, that stopped uh, uh, at some point. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of all retreated to our corners and, 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 uh, and, and the conversations uh, ceased. But, but we, the, 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 the regeneration of that is, is there. And, and there's no special formula other than talking and listening. And you're not gonna get it right to, in the first conversation. But if you continue to think about it and you will realize that there's more, we have more things in common than, than not. Um, and uh, um, it, and there's, there's, there's more interaction that is going to benefit all of us. Uh, than going into our enclaves and, 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 and just focusing on what is good or bad for, for, for our community. Um, so I'm hopeful, uh, extremely hopeful. Um, I, I think that in the absence of this pandemic, I'm not sure we would be here. Uh, so I think there is some uh, benefit to that, but um, I, 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 I am in no way saying that the loss of over 250,000 people, it was worth um, us having, uh, getting back to a conversation, not at all. Uh, but the conversation is required, the conversation is necessary, and the conversation is happening. And I wanna thank the museum for being uh, an anchor for that. Um, but but let's continue that and in, in we, we can formalize it or not formalize it, but the conversations have to be had. Well, you're precisely right. The conversations do need to continue. And Michael, you're correct to raise the next great challenge that the entire state, the entire country, the entire world faces combating the threat of coronavirus. And in just a minute, uh, we're going to use our last round of, of conversation to talk about combating the threat of COVID, particularly in at-risk and, and vulnerable communities. Before we do, I do want to just quickly address a couple of the questions that have come in. Uh, to the Q&A asking about Prop 16 before we move on to this conversation about the coronavirus. Uh, Avia uh, asks if we have a sense as to how many Biden voters versus Trump support voters supported Prop 16. And I'd say, well, Avia, what was noticeable ab about the, the poll results is we did see uh, a large number of Republicans, a large number of Trump supporters who agreed that discrimination was an issue that needed to be addressed, although not at the same level as among Biden supporters. But as a few of the panelists mentioned earlier, one of the greatest challenges is not convincing more people that discrimination exists, but using the results of the uh, election to find an alternative to address it in a way that more voters find, uh, more voters find to be accessible. And my friend, uh, my friend Ben Wong asks a really, really smart question. He says, to what extent did the language of Prop 16, which el would eliminate a provision in the state constitution that prohibits discrimination on the basis of race, create confusion for those who support racial equality, but didn't understand that affirmative action would be allowed if Prop 16 passed. Ben, what you should know is at the insistence of our three uh, partnering organizations, we included follow-up questions which clarified to a greater degree than the ballot initiative itself did what voters thought about uh, uh, this question. And what we found, as our panelists have mentioned, is voters, while they did agree that discrimination was a matter of great concern that needed to be addressed, once again, they simply did not see this, even with a greater explanation, as the, as the preferred solution. So let's move on now and let's talk about COVID. And we're a little bit short on time, so perhaps this is a conversation we begin today and continue in the early part of next year, as Michael suggested a moment ago. So Helen, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come right back to you. So we've, all four of you have talked, I think in a very poignant and very yeah, uplifting way about the lessons we've learned from this year of 2020. How can we apply those lessons given the renewed threat of COVID, especially in these vulnerable communities? 
Well, I think there's a couple of things. Um, there's lessons learned. I hope that our government, both at the state and national level, learn that um, when we're talking about if there is a next stimulus package, that a lot needs to be done in low income communities. And it's specifically in the Latino community that did not receive many of the small business loan opportunities or grants that was available. So I think um, the disbursement, if there is a next stimulus package, I hope that government has learned that it wasn't an equitable way of how they did it and they need to figure out how to do that in a much more equitable way. I think for our healthcare, especially um, in the LA County healthcare department, where we're talking about solutions and especially around the vaccine that we hope will get approved soon and that it's an effective, the rollout of that vaccine, the communication around that vaccine has to be entrusted with commu by community leaders and community messengers. Um, and I hope that's a, a, a part of the solution and the um, of how LA County hopes, you know, as they are going to be charged as with the health care of, of this rollout of this, as well as the state, really take into consideration how they're bringing in community leaders, community organizations to talk about the vaccine. Uh, we know that a trusted, according to our poll, we know that the only people that seem to uh, have a real high level of trust among the individuals that answer a poll are either scientists or community leaders, but specifically scientists and doctors. So we have to be smart about this and we need to create those avenues of communication and creating trust within our community to solve this. So basically two things, we need to make sure that the resources go where it's most needed and that the vaccine is being rolled out with the support of community leadership and smart doctors and scientists in the front lines. Boy. So a short, unambitious list to be <laughs> sure, but perhaps we can expand it uh, once we get into 2021. Um, Julie, in addition to the, 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 the substantive policy goals that, that, that Helen talked about, it seems to me, and I know it also seems to you, that the individuals, the leaders in our organ, the leaders in our communities, our, our, our elected officials, and ourselves as community leaders, have a role to play to help move toward those policy solutions. Can you talk a little bit about the role of leadership in moving toward those goals? Sure. I mean, I think that the first thing that those who do hold a leadership role need to do is um, a bit of a bit of a a reckoning and recognition of the socioeconomic hit that minority communities have taken. I mean, they've, take, it, they've taken a hit on so many levels in terms of health, education, um, economics, everything. But, you know, specifically along with what Helen was saying, um, the equitable distribution of help has been a real issue. The Paycheck Protection Program, for example, um, the Brookings Institute just came out with a really interesting study about the dis distribution um, inequality of the PPP and really the um, this the based on zip code is really was the determinant of whether small businesses were able to um, take advantage of this loan. And a lot of that was systemic. It was, you know, there are there's a dearth of community banks where a lot of these loans were going through in minority communities. And that is something that we really have to look at. And as we begin to rebuild, it's our opportunity to really change the trajectory of things and respond to this in a way that um, recognizes the equity issues and the social disparity. And, you know, we, we really have to partner together, we have to come together to work on this. One thing that we're doing um, that I'm really proud of with Jewish Center for Justice is we've just joined with McCarty Memorial Church to create a 
Community Development Corporation called Partnership for Growth LA. We are very fledgling and um, what we're doing together is looking at the long-term effects that COVID could have and figuring out how we can work in directly in communities with the community to rebuild in a way that we don't find ourselves having these same conversations 10 years from now. Um, I love being in conversation with all of you guys. Hopefully we're, we're gonna move forward. So 10 years from now, we will be, the conversation will be like, look at the great things that we've done. Yeah, that's that's exactly right, Julie. And it really does speak to the role of all of us, of all of you as, as leaders. Um, but, you know, Michael, one of the things that I always try, tell my students is I tell them that leadership is a team sport. And it's not just about individuals, even extraordinary individuals like you know, the other four of you we have on the, on the panel today. But each of you represents a very big and broad and impactful organization. And we have a question in the chat box uh, from someone who wants to know how they can get more involved. And hopefully by the end of the program, we'll be able to post the organization's websites um, in the chat box. And if not, we'll send them out by email. Um, and we'll of course be continuing these conversations next year. So keep your eye on the museum's website to find out when, and, uh, when they'll be continuing. Michael, can, if we can though, can we talk about the importance of trust for a minute, particularly as it comes to, to fighting the pandemic? We're getting closer, hopefully, to the distribution of a vaccine. And it's very clear from public opinion polling that there's very few traditional sources of leadership that people trust anymore. Political leaders, business leaders, that trust isn't there. Can that trust comes from organizations like the four of like the like the four of yours um i think quite frankly it has to um trust is a function of uh is born out of integrity and 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 again being a part of a conversation as opposed to uh just uh demanding that people do what you say uh and it's built over time um we have uh a, when I look at the coalition of community organizations and, and the leadership of these organizations, I am um, um, not only impressed, but humbled by the, the talent and the skill and, and the time and effort that, that uh, um, the people on this panel and the people who are not on this panel put into the work that they do. Uh, and, and with that comes uh, they are there because of their integrity. They are there because of their uh, commitment to doing the right thing. Um, will we be able to convince everyone? Not necessarily, but the fact is that um, um, the, 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 the integrity, our reputation for integrity is built up over time. And uh, it is uh, the one thing that we, all have to guard uh, jealously. Um, given the the internet and the the, the, the specious uh, information that comes through the internet, and and I'm still uh, marveling is the wrong word, but 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 uh, surprised at the number of people who believe what they see on the internet from someone they, they do not know. Um, we have to do our best to combat that and make sure that people um, hear what we need. We, we need to speak up and and say what we believe and uh, and, and, and move us in the right direction. Um, the, the people on this panel, do we hope that uh, this will be done uh, that the um, uh, that the internet won't uh, take over everything, but there are a lot of people who believe what they they read and not what they hear. Uh, but we are we are putting that out on our our website. Will be very clear uh, about the importance of uh, being able to to uh, get these vaccinations 
when they are available. Uh, and we'll talk about the process by which uh, these uh, 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 vaccinations were uh, vetted and in our um, uh, role in this in terms of, of uh, you know, keeping, keeping them accountable, keeping the, 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 the organizations that put these together accountable. Uh, so we, it's been a long and difficult uh, year. And as you mentioned earlier, it's, it's we're, you look at the, at, the, at the calendar and you say, it can't be December. <laughs> but it is. Uh, <clears throat> and this all started about a year ago. Um, it's been a long time. And, uh, but we are going to continue to move forward. And uh, I, I will hope that our voices uh, are heard by uh, the majority of the people that we serve. Michael, I, I, I think that's exactly right. And I'll apologize. Well, uh, I think we're going to go just a minute or two over because I think it's really important, even given our usual time limits, for Nancy to have a chance to take Michael's point about trust and offer some practical steps that we need to be taking. Um, I will note also that uh, the amazing Safina has posted the websites for our four organizations um, in the chat box. So anyone who'd like to get involved can reach out to any of those organizations and to the museum. And just as a reminder, we'll be back here in 2021 to continue these conversations. And we're excited to have you as a part of them. But Nancy, building trust, as, as Michael talked about, is not only laudable, it's necessary. How can that be done? So I think that there's uh, a lot of what Michael just shared about trust, but also um, some of the conversation that we're having, not just with one another, but the idea of conversation. An openness to conversation is also about trust and the communities that we serve have learned to trust our organizations or they wouldn't have um, the history that they all have. I think it's a trust that we continue to earn. And I think that there are a lot of nonprofits that do the work of reaching out to our communities where there are gaps. And so in relation to the vaccine and even to some of these issues around racial justice, our communities look to our leaders, to us as leaders and to our partners as um, information sources, but also people um, who they can Look, look to for information. And so one of the things, and, and for me, I think is important from a personal story is a thing that I heard a lot um, during this last November 3rd election is that people would call me to ask about propositions. And I found myself um, sharing information from my partner organizations, not because the propositions were perfect, but because I know all of us are doing the work and we will hold folks accountable to making it better. And I think that that is why it's important to support the nonprofit sector. I think that there should be funding towards the organizations who can reach out to these communities um, because there isn't trust around the vaccine. It's not widespread. Um, the communication needs to come from people who are trusted like the scientists and health professionals, but getting word out in language, getting word out um, in a way that our communities trust it um, we need to do that in partnership with the organizations who have those relationships and have built that trust. Um, and so to me, one of the things that uh, not just this partnership is not lip service, we, we respect one another, but I know for me, uh, a little behind the scenes Wizard of Oz moment is the conversations that we have leading to this panel, I think have also helped us to continue to think about what strategies are moving forward. So whether it's our organizations or an organization that represents something you're passionate about, actually just getting involved in nonprofits can really help with some of these gaps that we're seeing. Thank you very much, Nancy. It's the perfect last word for not only this program, but for this year, at least this year as it relates to our own ongoing Building Bridges series. Um, as Michael mentioned earlier, we will be back in 2021. We're still figuring out the details of that and we'll let you all know once we know. Uh, once again, for Christy or anyone else who would like to find ways to get involved, you do see all four of the organization's websites. And of course you can contact the museum as well. And we're eager, we're excited to have you in the conversation as we confront not only these challenges, but the next ones to, to come before us. 
So thank you, Nancy Yap. Thank you, Julie Bank. Thank you, Michael Lawson. and thank you, Helen Tautas, not just for joining us today, but for all the good work and the amazing work that you and your colleagues at each of your organizations do. Once again, thanks to, uh, to Michelle, to Beth Keen, uh, to Wendy and to Safina and the team at the museum for all the great work they do. And most importantly, thanks to all of you for joining us for these conversations. We find them uh, very enriching and very empowering. And we hope all of you do too. Hope everyone has a very happy holiday season and we'll look forward to seeing you again in the new year. Thanks so much.